All right. How's it going, everybody? Uh, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, tonight's going to be a really, really fun show. Um, I think that most everybody is going to be familiar with, with Bill Straub of Fourgate. Um, you know, he's been really doing some, some fantastic things. And I thought that this would be a really good kind of like reintroduction for them and the brand a, a little bit. They've just released um, their batch six, uh, which Again, without giving away the the farm or the you know whatever, it's an absolutely fantastic um, finished bourbon. Again, so again, I think it'll be. I th I just think it'll be a, a good a good way to if you already know a little bit about Fourgate. Um, I think you'll you'll get a little bit more out of this. Obviously, get to hear about the new release, and then also you know hear a little bit more um, you know about just the brand itself. So um, without further ado. Let me uh, let me bring in Bill here, and we'll uh, we'll kind of get going. So, <laughs> all right, Bill, thanks for joining tonight. I appreciate it. Hey, man, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. So, yeah, like I was saying before, I think this will be a good idea for people who already know a little bit about the brand. You know, great. I think you'll learn a little bit more if you if you aren't familiar with it. You know, this will be a good chance. I think tonight to to really get a good idea of of what they're doing at Fourgate. I think a lot of people are going to be really amazed that there are companies out there outside of the big boys that that really are doing some absolutely fantastic things. And you know, I make no bones about it that, you know, I really really enjoy, you know, what Fourgate is doing. So, and I think there's a lot of other people that will will kind of echo that uh as well. So, before we uh, before we get into things, let me just uh, say hi to everybody in the chat. We had a few uh, a few of the pre gamers and stuff in here before. So uh, Chris Beaton, how's it going, buddy? Uh, let's see, Bourbon Bunnies, probably Neil, uh, Will Henderson, how's it going? Jason, the Mash and Drum, how are you? Uh, who else we got here? Wildlife and Whiskey, Chad Holly, how's it going? Uh, Christopher David, how are you, Christopher? Richie Z. Uh, hopefully, I didn't miss anybody. Wes Jolly, I think uh, Bill, you know him. Yeah, I might have heard of that guy once or twice. Yeah, I think so. Terry Coast, how's it going? Thanks for jumping in. Appreciate it. Uh, who else we have? Andrew Spurrell, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think that's it. Um, nope, Brent from the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Reviews, who, by the way, just did a uh, a review of the Batch Six. So go check that out if you haven't. Um, who else here? Nick, how's it going? Uh, Dusty Dan, how's it going, buddy? Trev Wilson. All right. I think that's it. Hillbilly select reviews. All right. So let's get going here. So, um, I guess in the event, somebody or some people out there don't know a little bit about you, if you don't mind kind of sharing a little bit of your, uh, your background and, uh, kind of how you got started in the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Um, I started out uh, with modernthirst.com with a couple of friends of mine. We founded that back in 2014. Um, and that was kind of early in the in the whiskey boom. Um, through that, I, I kind of got pulled into doing uh, some consulting work where I would go out with uh, retailers and groups and help them pick private barrels when that whole process was new. Um, it was a little intimidating at first, and, and it's gotten a little easier, and they don't really need that anymore. Um, but uh, I got pulled in from a couple of major brands to help them launch a couple of their um, extensions to their lines, uh, kind of picking the blends and, and helping them with, with some marketing and blending along with a couple other folks. So I did some consulting that way. And I, and I was introduced to a, who's now become a very good friend of mine, Bobby D'Antoni, uh, who's my business partner at Fourgate. He had a relationship with Kelvin Cooperage. And he just wanted me to come out and, and write a story for Modern Thirst on Kelvin Cooperage. And it honestly just blew me away. Um, and it at the same time, Wes Jolly, who's here on this this chat tonight, he introduced me to, to Scotch and other world whiskeys that are aged in these other barrels. If you go out to, to Kelvin, they have this whole warehouse full of hundreds, thousands of barrels from all over the world in addition to the ones that they Cooper knew. And it got me thinking, um, because there is barrel finishing, obviously, with American whiskey, but it's not really at the time anyway, it really wasn't that widespread and people weren't doing anything interesting with it. It was, yeah, I, I, we'll take a sherry barrel, a red wine barrel, and we're done. Uh, that was That was kind of the way it worked. Um, and I looked at I looked at Kelvin Cooper just just uh, you know if you were kind of a whiskey nerd and wanted to play around and, and do a little mad scientist stuff it's a playground for that. Um, so Bob and I started Fourgate Whiskey Company um, and we're the two operators of it now. Uh, quick shout out to Bob his father passed away this morning uh, so prayers to to Bob's family. Yeah, definitely um, condolences. 
But um, so what we do is we partner with Kelvin Cooper, John, on all of our batches. So we will blend the whiskey. Bob and I, Bob, Bob kind of locates all these barrels. We taste it. We decide what we want. Uh, we come up with a blend and we go down to Kelvin Cooperage and we taste it and we talk about what do you guys have or what can you get or what do you think would be wild if we could find it somewhere to do with this whiskey? What would, what would it complement it best? Um, we started with a dual use barrel that was originally uh, sherry and then rum for our first batch. And that kind of, we've kind of come full circle back. It's one year later, um, batch six now is our, we, we called the first one the Kelvin collaboration. And this is Kelvin collaboration too, because where that one had the sherry rum barrels, this time we're going to stick with that fortified rum, but or fortified wine, but this time it's cognac. And this, and because it's not a dual use barrel, we also got some dark rum barrels from the original distillery from batch, from the first batch, batch one of the Kelvin collaboration. So this is a 12 year old Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Uh, it's that same high rye mash bill that was was in that first batch. It's a different blend, obviously. It's non chill filtered. It came out at 126.4 proof, and um, just really, it, we just thought it was a good homage to our first batch, so we called it the Kelvin Collaboration too. Uh, it's a slight twist on it because instead of the sherry influence, we have cognac, but really tasty. Uh, we're really pleased with how it came out. Yeah, and you should be. I, I've had some the other day, and I haven't done my review yet. I kind of sat down with it just to kind of let it open up and just kind of take your time. And it's, it was one of those, those whiskeys that you just knew right away that this was going to be something that you, you needed to kind of take your time with a little bit to really pull out a lot of the flavors. Um, the one thing I guess, before we kind of jump back a little bit with the batch six, I, I thought like it was one of those, again, the whiskeys where crack the top, let that thing sit for even a couple of days, you know, pour it out 15, 20 minutes before. And I, I knew I was about ready to really be like rewarded in terms of what I was going to like nose and taste just from the first sniff. And I knew just let this thing breathe a little bit and it was just going to like rear its head. And fortunately it did. And I mean, I think for a few people who have done some reviews, they've all been, you know, so far really positive and rightfully so. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really, fantastic whiskey and you know you guys should be should be very uh you know happy about this release we're we're thrilled uh we can't wait to send it to whiskey advocate they've uh they've reviewed four of ours so far and, and we've done real well on those um but uh we get just as excited if not more so when we send it out to the uh, all the the social media outlets like you guys and and um um, Oak and Smoke, I think, has already done one, and and uh, a bunch of other guys who are on the chat tonight who who have their own channels and their own outlets have, have some as well. But we get just excited about that because that's really where the, you know, the whiskey geeks, that's where they've turned to in the la in the last six years is they go to the blogs and they go to podcasts and they go to YouTube channels and they're not really there's they're still a lot of the hardcore whiskey people are still doing the whiskey advocate and they do the bourbon review and um, all the the print materials too. But um, you know, in today's day and age, it's, it's a different a different um, consumer base than it was 10 years yeah. ago. And they're, they're more plugged in. They're more, more interested in what's going on that you can kind of see and hear it so much yeah. as just read it on a page. So we want to hit everything. We're thrilled with Whiskey Advocate, but uh, we're not doing our job if we're not coming out and talking to, to everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and to me, I think that's important. You guys get that. I mean, you see, there's a couple of other companies out there. Um, I guess I'll say, you know, like Brown Foreman and Jackie Zykin, who I think they've kind of done a good job in terms of like listening to what the people are saying and it's translated. You start to see that kind of like unfolding. And I think by getting all of these products out to the people who have different opinions and just whatever it may be, just different thoughts and reviews and all that. I mean, I, I think we as kind of whiskey nerds and people kind of in the little group here, you know, you come to respect certain people's palates. And if you know, someone likes something or doesn't, you know, you kind of take that, you know, to heart. So to me, I think it's a very important thing that, that you guys do and you get it. And I think part of your background with starting out as just basically being a whiskey lover, you understand that better than, you know, a lot of people do. So, I mean, I, 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 am still in, we still run modern thirst. We still write, we still record. Um, it's, it's my passion. Uh, this has become a second job, but modern thirst is a hobby and a passion. And, and I just know from experience that that's where the new consumer of bourbon whiskey and American whiskey in particular, that's where they turn to for just to, to not just reviews, but just general information and camaraderie yeah. and community. And, and there's a whole community out there. I mean, the, the people that are on your chat right now, I mean, there's 32 people or more, you know, right now who, who they're probably also not sitting around reading whiskey advocate every day. Yeah. 
there yeah. are thousands and thousands of people who do, but there's a whole community out there that wants interaction. Yeah, exactly. I, it's like kind of the immediate gratification. It's something physical, tangible, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very, a very important thing. So I know there's a couple of questions in here before we get into those. What I wanted to, to kind of briefly do was let's go back a little bit in terms of like uh, some of the, the first releases or just a few of them. And, you know, if you don't mind, just kind of go over a couple of them as to, you know, what they were and like, what, what led you to making those, those blends or those batches itself? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mentioned batch one, the Kelvin collaboration. We, we wanted to come out with our oldest whiskey. So that was 11 and a half years old. Uh, it was the oldest stuff that we had at the time. We kind of wanted to make a splash with it. And uh, Kelvin guided us on that finish from the start. They, they said, we've got these six big uh, X sherry rum casks. You got to come out and check them out. They smelled like a combination of maple syrup and grape jelly. They were just amazing. Um, as soon as we smelled them, we knew that's what we wanted. Um, the second batch, we kind of wanted to experiment a little bit. And uh, when we, I blended what was initially not quite, it, it was a little more sweet towards spice uh, as opposed to spicy. Um, but they wanted us to check out these uh, originally orange curacao barrels that were then used for gin. Uh, I was totally opposed. Number one, I, I thought gin's a little off the wall, but I, I don't like orange curacao finished bourbons because I think it overpowers it. But those barrels, the gin had really cut the sweetness of the orange curacao and it made it into a very tangy orange kind of flavor that I thought was very unique and I, I really enjoyed um, so what we did is we went back and added more of the older whiskey to the blend to make it a little, the, the older whiskey we had at the time was spicier compared to the younger stuff, which was very corn forward and sweet. Um, so we kind of wanted to offset some of the, that tangy orange sweetness and spiciness with a spicier bourbon in it. So we went back and we kept adding, adding, adding until, till I kind of felt like that's exactly what we wanted to do. And Bob and I, uh, we, we take, we must've tasted 50 different blends of that, of what we wanted to go into those barrels. Uh, we call that outer loop orbit. We tried to go with Mercury 62 and the TTB shot us down because they thought we were violating first uh, Ford's patent and then NASA's patent or trademark on Mercury because uh, we were referencing the Mercury 1962 moon mission where Alan Shepard took Tang orange drink into outer space and made it famous. <laughs> um, uh, after that, Bob found uh, some nine year, nine month. Olds. It, we actually originally thought it was 10 year old. Uh, it turns out that of the uh, the batch that we bought, there was one barrel accidentally dumped that was nine years, nine months. Uh, but it was some really, really amazing uh, Kentucky straight bourbon. And we kept tasting it and kept tasting it. And Bob and I kept looking at each other and he kept saying, I, can we just put this in a bottle? And I kept saying, I, I don't want to do anything to it. Let's take it to Kelvin. And we took it down there and and uh, William Hornaday tasted it and he said, just just, you know, blend, come up with the blend and, and put it out there. So that's what we did. We called it foundation because the foundation of what we do is always great whiskey. We, I don't, I'm not saying that anyone in particular does this, but there has been this um, perception over the years that people who barrel finish their whiskey are trying to cover up flaws with the whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. We want to start with good whiskey and then play around with the flavor and add, you know, add to it. We don't want to, we don't want to cover anything up. Um, so that came out and that was our batch three foundation. It was, it was phenomenal. It sold out pretty much instantly. Uh, it was very small. I think it was 500 bottles is about all we did of it. Um, while we were, uh, doing the next batch, we were working on the next batch. Bob actually found some more of that. Um, so we, we actually released as batch five, skipping ahead one. We released another foundation batch of about 700 bottles. And we just got a little bit more of that sent to a uh, seal box. So if there's, if you're looking for that one, um, uh, Rare Breed 101 and a couple other folks have some great reviews of it out there. And and three and five are essentially the same batch. It's a different blend of the same whiskey, but that received a 92, I think, on, on Whiskey Advocate. It's fantastic. Um, so that might be on Sealbox right now. Um, yeah, I actually then, did. I'll, I'll just interrupt you real quick. I did um, I did put a link to the Sealbox in there. And I think there was, I think it was two, maybe maybe two, four, five, and six. That sounds right. Yeah, I think it was batches two, four, five, and six. So anyway, I just threw the link in there. I'll throw it in a couple more times in the event you guys are looking for it. So, all right, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, but while while that was all going on, we were working on our batch four. And batch four was kind of our, um, it was very special to us because we do everything we can with Kelvin Coopers. They're, they are the the greatest guys in the world. Um they're they're so passionate about this. They we we love to work with them on all of these and collaborate with them. And what we had done so far is either the unfinished bourbon or we'd use used cooperage, which is what they do a lot of business in used cooperage. Um, but we wanted them to show off their skills with new cooperage, and that was our uh, four gate foundation, the red label you got there. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, not foundation. Yep. Split stave by Kelvin. Um, 
we had them cooper some uh, toasted barrels and some number two and number four char barrels. And then they, before they were used, they were brand new. They pulled them all apart and they put them back together. And so they alternated toasted, charred, toasted, charred. It looks like a zebra on the yeah. inside of it. And we finished for five months in those. So that's a combination of kind of a, a double barreled and a toasted finish. Uh, it's one, it's one of my absolute favorites. There's just so much cocoa and, and uh, smokiness to that. I just, it's one of them that I kind of find myself yeah. reaching for at night um, here in my house. And I, I have lots of all of our batches. Um, yeah, so it, was, it was fantastic. It was, it was one of those ones. I'm like, I knew when I tasted it, just all the different flavors it had, I, I knew I had to get, get my hands on it. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Well, we did that, that brought us kind of, uh, batch four was end of year one and then batch five, uh, it virtually came out at the same time, December of last year. They were supposed to come out in January, but the distributors kind of jumped the gun. They, I guess they were excited to get it out. Um, but they brought it out a few weeks early. So that was 2019. 2020, we've got batch six, which just came out, the Calvin Collaboration 2. And then we've already bottled, and this summer we'll be bringing out our uh, straight rye whiskey. It's uh, unfinished, seven years old. Um, it is 113.2 uh, proof. It is absolutely wonderful. Um, can't wait to get that out there. Well, and the, good, uh, and the exciting part, I think, for a lot of people is being able to get kind of a, a barrel strength rye whiskey. You know, there's just not a lot of good ones, you know, that are, that are, I mean, there's not many period. So when you can get a really good one, I think that's going to be one that a lot of people are going to be super, super excited for. So, well, I hope w one thing that I think um, is going to be kind of neat is if you can get a hold of this one, this, we call it river Kelvin Rye river Kelvin is the river in, in uh, Glasgow, Scotland that Calvin Cooper just named for. Um, if you can get that, that's a seven year old, it's unfinished barrel proof. And then at Christmas, that exact same whiskey is, has gone into split stave barrels. Um, they're they're going to be more heavy on the toast than on the char this time around. So if you get that and then around Christmas, you can get the split stave rye. Um, wow. You can kind of compare the before and after on that, which, which I think is gonna be really exciting. We, we really want to just play around with different formats and presentations and things like that. And, and I just think it'll be exciting. You know, that's a good springboard. So I think for, for me, and I think a lot of other people who are kind of understanding where a lot of these flavors and finishings and stuff are, are kind of coming from. But I think more importantly is the barrel just never seems to get for, from, for a lot of people, the, the deserve it should, you know, essentially be getting. So yeah. with that being said, why don't you talk a little bit about like the barrel selection process and like what, how and why you guys decide to kind of do what it is that you do. Uh, on the blend side or on the finishing side? Well, I guess, I guess let's, let's start with just the, like the, the finishing side and then we'll go to the blending where we can kind of mix um, both of them. Yeah. So what we do is, is I'll, I'll typically come up with a number of different blends of whiskey based on whatever we think we're kind of going for at the time. So we have, uh, we've bought, I don't know, 200 something barrels of whiskey over the last year and a half. And, and we get samples from everything and we taste it. Um, and while they vary barrel to barrel, they also have certain characteristics. The, the 18% rye bourbon that we have is all within a spectrum is all kind of similar. And then the six, five and six year old stuff was all kind of similar from the same distillery. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of how that blend turns out. And if we, if you go heavy towards the, the older stuff, for example, it tends to be spicier. So when we come up with these blends that I, I think this time I want to do a very spicy or pepper forward or, or, or clove forward type of whiskey, um, we start thinking about what would complement that really well. So Bob and I will kind of taste it and we'll come up with, with what we like of, of the different blends. And then we'll take it down to Kelvin Cooperage and we'll have uh, Paul McLaughlin, who's the, the owner, his, his brother just passed away this past uh, December. Um, and then um, William Hornaday, who is their director of operations. Um, and we'll, we'll taste it together and we'll talk about, uh, every, everyone kind of puts input of what we think would complement this really well. What are we trying? And we do more than just say what would taste cool. We think we'll, what are we trying to accomplish with this? So with the first batch we did, for example, and it's the same with this batch six, um, the only thing that we don't love about the underlying whiskey is that the finish kind of drops off very quickly. It's very dry, very short, a little bit astringent. It just kind of sucks the moisture out of your mouth. Yeah. Um, so we like that. The fact that we've used rum influence on both of them, rum is very sweet, it's yeah. very viscous and mouth coating as a finish. So the first thing it does is it kind of extends that that finish. So it doesn't fall off a cliff and, it, and it, instead it just kind of kind of rides and fades into sweetness with a little bit of barrel tannins left over from that, that underlying bourbon. So 
you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a conversation. For example, the split stave stuff is fun because it's like playing playing Jenga or, or not Jenga, but um, Tetris or something because we're trying to decide with this rye. Um, okay, last time we tried toasted in number two, we tried toasted in number four. Uh, for the barrels, what are we going to do with the rye? What's going to complement it the most? And what we decided was is we don't want to go too heavy with the char. So we're going to do, we did um, either two or three toasted staves to every charred stave, and it was toasted and number two chars. There's no number four in that at all. So um, what we're really trying to do with toasting is there's this kind of a, a creme brulee, um, kind of a warm uh, baked goods type of, of sweetness yeah. you get out of toasting as opposed to char. So we're just kind of trying to highlight a little bit of that with the the rye, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's incredible. And that's the one that's, I shouldn't say the one thing. That's one thing I really enjoy with what you guys do with a lot of your finishing, you know, whiskeys is not only the, the secondary barrels that you're finishing it in, but when you start to experiment with like that zebra barrel and getting some different flavors and, and all of that, I mean, to me, that's where kind of like the almost like innovation and just the the difference that you guys do versus really what anybody else is doing. So each, you know, blend or each batch that comes out, it's always going to be something different and unique. And like you said, you know, you're not trying to do something that's the the same every time. There's no fun in, in that. But the the <laughs> flip side is that, you know, you guys do a great job with each batch being different and everyone is is anticipating and expecting for like the next really good batch to come out. And so far, I think you guys have, have done a really, really nice job with that. Yeah. We, you know, part of what, what makes it fun for us is that, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to have all of the whiskey that we release, but if, if you think it's good, it's not going to come out again. So if you want to collect, if you want to buy it and drink it by, by all means, that's what I do. If you're a collector, it gives you something to collect any of them that you want to, because they are all different. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, we've never done more than what, 2,700 bottles, I think was the biggest batch we've done. And, it's, it, and I don't think we'll come anywhere close to that this year on any of the batches. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's fun for us. It, it's always different. And one of the big reasons is we couldn't, we couldn't replicate a batch if we tried to, because we, yeah. since we source our whiskey and we're small. So we do it in very small quantities. We don't have 200 of the same, 200 barrels of the same whiskey out there to, to pull from. You know, if we, if we buy 10 or 15 barrels at a time, they're used up after a batch or two. So yeah, can't yeah. really can't really duplicate one if we tried. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I got to go back and say uh, thanks to uh, Brent from the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Reviews. Um, he says, uh, love what you're doing, Bill. Outstanding bourbon whiskey and cheers to me. So, yeah, I mean, he and I talk quite a bit about, you know, some some things and and he I mean, he he really enjoys the stuff as well. You know, so let me let me go back to kind of a, a part B to that to that question was the finishing part of it in terms of the secondary barrels, what, what is it and why do you guys come up with those particular ones to kind of finish things in like the, it's not just one, you know, particular, like a, you know, a Sherry or a Cognac, it's multiple barrels. And I'm always curious to, to know, like, how did you come up with like how you're going to do, do that barreling? Well, this is the first one where we actually combined two barrels because the the first batch were the it was the same barrel it was originally a sherry barrel and then a rum barrel, um, so it was it was just one set of finishing barrels. On this one, we were trying to pay homage a little bit to that first batch, which was that sherry rum combination. Well, we don't have cognac rum barrels uh, available, so the next best thing was to go to the same distillery that aged rum in the first one and buy a bunch of dark rum barrels from them. You will see some stuff from us in the next year that are single single barrel. We have we bought a bunch of those dark rum barrels and we liked them so much that we're going to have a batch that's just dark rum. Interesting. Um, they're fantastic from down in Key West. Um, just wonderful, wonderful barrels. Um, it'll it'll just be finished in those. Um, and then we have a number of other ones. We we have found some other uh, dual use barrels. And Bob works really hard uh, working hand, hand in hand with Calvin Cooper's to find those. Um, that's really what he spends a, a great part. He does his full time. He spends a great part of his day making phone calls and networking and just seeing what he can find out there. And he's found some um, Oloroso Sherry, some PX Sherry, um, some uh, Ruby Port rum. Uh, so we've got a lot of a lot of things that we're playing around with. And we have we have in the secondary barrels just kind of cooking right now. And, and whenever they're ready, uh, because we don't want to just release a bunch of batches all at once, whenever they're ready, what we do, we taste every about three to four weeks of every batch is we'll dump it into a stainless steel tank until we're ready to bottle it. Yeah. Is the, we is, don't want to I, overcook. 
is the idea to maybe, I mean, I know you guys have been pretty aggressive with like releasing the batches and stuff is, is the idea to like maybe slow things down a little bit where you've got, you know, two or three releases, maybe a year versus, you know, trying to, you know, I don't want to say flood the market, of course, but, you know, for, you know, just to kind of slow it down for you guys. Cause I mean, obviously we know you can't rush this process and you're going to need, you know, time and more barrels and, and all of that. Yeah. So I, I would expect that, uh, I don't know that we'll do like a small number of batches this year, but I think our batches are going to be smaller this year. Um, okay. one thing that we want to do is have a library of finished whiskey, uh, in these holding tanks so that in the future, one thing that we can do is we might have 350 gallons of our, um, whiskey finished in a dark rum barrel. We may have 200 gallons of something in a sherry barrel where we can do some blending and, and really play around with finished whiskey as opposed to blending before we put it in the in the secondary barrel. So we're going to hold back, I think, some of our stuff this year and, and just kind of keep a little library of that that we can use going forward. Yeah. Um, but our first year, we really only intended three major releases. And, and what happened was is there was a huge delay in the second batch because of, of issues getting the labels printed. Um, and it delayed everything by about six weeks. So batches two, it was supposed to be uh, four months apart, um, three major batches. And then the foundation was supposed to be just one very small batch between uh, batches two and three. Uh, but because of that delay, two, three, and four came out within about a month of each other. Uh, yeah. And we weren't we weren't thrilled with that, but we had to do that in order to get back on track going forward. Yeah, and I was kind of, I was I was always wondering, I'm like you know, why so many of the batches kind of like back to back. And I just, I, I mean, I figured you had some kind of plan or there was something going on for, for that, but it, it was never, it's not very easy, generally speaking, like on, on the wallet either. So the wife, yeah. the wife gets a little bit upset with that, but we're is. trying to keep the cost down on these. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the rye that comes out this, uh, this, Oh, we might have lost Bill a little bit here. Can you do you oh, have me? Yep, there, there oh. you are. Uh, so our, our rye coming out this summer will be, I think, one seventy five as opposed to two hundred. Um, and the split stay was down a little bit. This one's back up to two hundred. This batch six, just because it's the oldest whiskey we have. Um, it yeah. cost us a lot to get it. All right. Well, there's Jason. He said he's ordering his batch six right now. So <laughs> good man, Jason. Yeah, and and I think I just uh, again. So I know Michael before Michael Klein asked. Um, if what the kind of the distribution and stuff was, that's what made me put the, uh, the link and everything back in there. So yeah, I know you can go to seal box. Mm -hmm. They've got, again, I think it was two, four, five, and six available, I think right now. So if you're looking for, uh, for any of those, go, go check out uh, sealbox.com. The link is, is in the, in the chat. So check that out. So yeah. Well, I know I mean, we're I, distributed in Kentucky and Tennessee and we're, we're having some discussions with an Indiana distributor right now, hoping to, to get there this summer sometime. And then maybe by the end of the year, hopefully uh, maybe another state too. Cool. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Is there, um, is there an idea, I guess, in terms of expansion into, into more states, just the ability to get, you know, more barrels of, of whiskey, is that kind of in the works too, to try to like ramp up, you know, what it is you're able to, to kind of produce? Well, part of it is just that I, I get emails every day, two or three emails a day of people who are generally retailers just asking uh, if they can, get some for their store. Um, and we just know that, that, you know, if you, if you have a, a product that's $175, $200, there's limited number of people who are going to buy that in any state. Um, yeah. So we just don't want it all concentrated in one place. We, we want to, you know, we want people to be able to get it. We're not trying to make it impossible for anyone to, to get our whiskey or anything like that. We're just, you know, we just don't have the resources of a, of one of the big boys to put out 20,000 bottles of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's nice. I mean, it's nice for, you know, a, a brand and company like you to be able to access something like a seal box and, and be able to, you know, get things out because it is, I mean, there's a lot of us, I mean, we all know, I mean, the distribution of things is so frustrating for a lot of people and the inability for a lot of us to be able to get a lot of these whiskeys that other states get, um, you know, to be able to have the resource to go and, and get a few things now online, um, it's it's important to to kind of have that stuff. I mean, I think it's even more important for you know brands your size to be able to get you know these mm -hmm. these whiskeys out to the to the masses, so to speak. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, there, Michael says, uh, "Yep, there goes there goes two hundred and four bucks." <laughs> 
We it appreciate is. your business. And it's, and it's all worth it. I mean, I think there's a lot of people, you know, that are in here who, who again, echo a lot of what I say. I mean, it's, you know, without trying to like blow smoke or anything like that, or, you know, be an ass kiss. I mean, it's really one of my favorite brands from the standpoint of the quality and, and really just what goes into each one of these these batches that you guys, you know, do. I mean, just knowing a little bit more and talking with you prior and knowing just a lot of what's involved, it makes you kind of appreciate, you know, that whiskey, you know, that much more. So it's a, an absolutely fantastic whiskey. So, and again, I'll, uh, let me throw the, uh, I'll throw the seal box thing in there one more time. And uh, if you guys want to check out, and there's a few of them, like I said before, so you're going to be Blake's best friend tonight. I know, but I, I know I'm surprised Blake's not in here already. I thought maybe if you uh, posted these a couple of times, it send him some kind of alert, but apparently not. So, but so I guess before we kind of get into talking a little bit more about the the batch six, um, is there is there anything else kind of like um, I don't want to say like you know in the works outside of like maybe the the batch seven, the ride that's coming out, like any other things that you're kind of excited or, or able to share a little bit of. You know, we've got uh, we've got one that's just dark rum finished. Uh, that'll be fall of this year, and then Christmas will be the rye split stave. Um, we've got a uh, PX sherry going right now uh, for next year. We we kind of have uh, most of twenty twenty seven, or at least half of twenty twenty seven planned out, or not twenty twenty seven, twenty twenty one. Um, so we've, because we're finishing stuff and it takes a few months to do that, we have to plan kind of way in advance with, with how that's going to happen. So we, we basically have our large releases planned for through mid 2021. Um, and we'll do another release of the rye next year, I think at eight years old. So yeah, that, that's, that's when I, I'm really like, I mean, just in addition to the, to the rye that's coming out, the one that's going to be finished in the, again, those split stave, that'll be really interesting to see the, the difference and the nuances that, you know, that, that barrel, you know, does on that. So, um, so with batch six, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, not necessarily batch six specifically, but just, um, the, the Kelvin Cooperage a little bit. I know you guys have a kind of an, um, a nice relationship with them. And I, I think, it's, it kind of would be some, you know, undo to not mention them and kind of, you know, the relationship that you guys have with them. So, yeah. So they, uh, th this is, uh, this is really where Bob D'Antoni just shines. He, he has a relationship with the, uh, the McLaughlin brothers, uh, going back years, uh, very good friends of theirs. Um, and he really, he, he, so if you ever meet those guys, they, they operate on a handshake. They don't sign contracts. They don't, um, you know, they don't go through all the legalese. If they say they're going to deliver, uh, you know, a hundred thousand barrels over the course of two years to somebody, uh, they'll shake your hand and by God, you'll get a hundred thousand barrels. Uh, yeah. that's just the way they operate. And, um, they're, they're true to their word and the respect that they have in the industry is unmatched. It's, it's, a, it was amazing to me, um, because I didn't even know before, before we got on this, on this project, um, you can talk to anyone in the industry and you bring up the McLaughlin's name and it's, they speak about him with reverence. He's everyone's best friend. Kevin yeah. McLaughlin, who, who unfortunately did pass away, was everyone's best friend. They just loved him. Um, he, he would go out of his way. If, if you became a business partner and he shook your hand, you were his friend. That There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And he yeah. wanted to make you successful. If he was going to do business with you, then he wanted everyone to succeed. Um, those guys, so it's, it's, uh, right now it's Paul McLaughlin, William Hornaday, Clayton back in the warehouse has been tasting all of our stuff with us and, and giving us advice. Um, those guys know more about barrels than I ever will. I mean, they, they're, you know, generations of doing it in Scotland and the U S um, they do it for a living. They deal, you know, they make new barrels and they, they sell, if you've ever been there, it is just trucks come in from all the major distilleries with these used bourbon barrels and they check them over and make sure that they're still good. And if they are, they go right back on another truck get put on a shipping container and they go over to Scotland or Japan or, or, you know, anyone who uses these, these used barrels. And then you walk in their warehouse and there's thousands of wine barrels and there's stacks of sherry barrels. They've had peated scotch barrels in there before mm -hmm. orange curacao. It's, it's like a, a candy store for someone who, who just wants to learn about and look at these barrels. It, it's amazing the work they do. Um, and anyone who uses them, you, you know, go to peerless, um, 
go to uh, Angel's Envy or any place who uses their new barrels, they they rave about those barrels. I mean, they rave about them. They are amazing, and the stuff that comes the, the stuff that comes out of their barrels are fantastic. I mean, people talk about how good Peerless was at two years old. You know, if you ask Corky about it, he says a lot of it has to do with those fantastic barrels they're getting from yeah. from Calvin Cooperage. So we're just absolutely thrilled that that they've uh, they've decided to work with us. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are without them. Um, and just amazing. There, there's a lot small. If you think about Independent Stave and you think about uh, the Brown yeah. Formage, Forman Cooperage, their uh, their craft compared to that. You know, there there's these barrels aren't going on a conveyor belt and getting getting gas shot through them to, to char them they're, Yeah, they take the, the clippings the wood clippings from the end of their staves when they when they size them down and they throw them in a fire and make charcoals out of them and they stand about 10 barrels in the middle of the warehouse under a big hood and they have guys that shovel these burning coals into the barrels and they, they cap them and they wait pull the barrels off and the flames shoot up they let them go for a few minutes and, and they kind of look and they say yeah it's, that's a number three they just know by, by smell and touch and look yeah. and sight and Roll them on out, and they roll ten more in. It, it's amazing the 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 craft that goes into this. It it truly is, you know, it's a craft for them. It, it's 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 a labor of love. It really is. Yeah, and that was you know that was one of the things I kind of wanted to, you know, kind of get out of you a little bit. I mean, I knew a little bit about like their background and like what they did, and I always thought like listening to them versus some of the big boys that it was it was still very like mom and pop ish from the standpoint of like what it is that they do and what they produce versus some of the big boys and, and all of that. I mean, and, and I think that makes it a little bit more special for you, you know, in terms of your collaboration with them and, and you know, what it is that you do and the whiskeys that, you know, you, you throw in their barrels and stuff. I, so I really think a company, you know, it's, it's a reflection of the people who operate it. And yeah. if you meet the McLaughlin's and William Hornaday who do operate it, they, they treat their employees like family. They, they honest to God do. I know it sounds like a cliche, but, but they care about them and they're friends with them and, and they're friendly with them. And, and it shows in, in the product they put out in the way they do business and people who do, do business with them to a person rave about them and just yeah. absolutely rave about them. Yeah. And that's, and that's important. I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff is important to me. And I think it just translates into, you know, what you guys do and, you know, into your, into your product and all of that. So I couldn't be more proud to be collaborating with them. Yeah. That's, that's good to hear. So, all right. Should we, you want to get into, uh, to batch six a little bit and we'll kind of do a, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil my review, but I mean, we may as well hear right from the, uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak, in terms of what do you, uh, what you're nosing and tasting. I've kind of gotten into it a little bit. And again, I know there's a couple people in the chat right now who've done reviews like Brent from the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Review. So if you want to hear what he has to say, go check out his channel. He reviewed Batch 6, I think, um, a few days ago or something. I'll, I'll be doing mine. I'm hoping to get it out either the end of this week or or this weekend. Um, so we'll see. I'm just time dependent right now. So, okay. all right. Why don't we, uh, why don't we kind of get into uh, into 6 here a little bit and kind of get your thoughts on some of it. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is our twelve year whiskey. It's a seventy four percent corn, eighteen percent rye, eight percent malted barley. So it's a high rye. Uh, it's Kentucky straight bourbon. At twelve years old, this is um, we we've, we've we've made the decision that we're going to tank our remaining barrels of this. Um, it is we, we think it's peaked. We don't want it to go any further on this. So it there's a very strong um, barrel tannin note to, uh, on the nose and on the mid palate on this one. Um, if you are a fan of aged bourbon, you're going to like this because it, it's not hidden by the cognac and rum finish. The no. age on this, it's it's a no. very spicy and and very uh, very well aged bourbon. It's it's tasty uh, in its own right. Um, it was it was, nose, def- it was definitely one of those those bourbons with the underlying notes that you could tell it was kind of like almost at you hate to say like a like a peak age, but you can tell like this was like a very very well aged you know, bourbon from the standpoint of like, it's, it's like right where you need it to be. Yeah. 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 It's a, I, I feel like it's one that if it, it, at 12 years old, I like it. And at 13 or 14, I probably wouldn't. So um, we, yeah. we, we're making the decision to not age it up anymore. Um, we don't have a ton of these barrels left anyway. So it's, it's not that uh, it's not like we have thousands of gallons sitting around, but um, yeah, but yeah, so we, we finished it anyway. these two massive uh, cognac butts or, or, they were massive barrels about as big as me. Um, and they were old. Uh, these things were, were old. Um, when they were sitting in the warehouse, we, we age, we, we finish ours, um, upright, uh, just because of the warehouse that we use prefers to palletize them, uh, for the finishing process. 
Um, so these things, uh, the heads had been wet for so long when we stood them up, it only took about a month before the heads warped on these massive, wow. these two massive barrels. And um, after maybe a month or so, when we would go in and check them, we, you, you really didn't need a whiskey thief anymore. Um, you could stick your hand in between the, the top staves of the barrel and just reach right in and touch whiskey. Um, wow. It was, uh, but, but they smelled so good. Uh, they were so tasty. Um, again, you know, this is the first one where we used two different barrels. And this was one of them where we, we had the conversation of, should we just put out a really small batch of nothing but cognac finish? Cause it tastes really good. Oh, that's a good, is that, is that something that you're considering down the line? We'd have to get new barrels cause these did not survive. Okay. Um, they are, they are gone. Um, but no, we, we, uh, we did try it with a blend as well and we did prefer the blend. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, um, when you, when you smell this, I can smell the age in the Oak. I definitely can. I can smell yeah. the, the influence of it. Um, but I get it. I get this kind of, um, this sweet fortified wine note. Yeah, um, kind of just under that, and it's kind of like a um, a white grape, um, almost a white wine kind of boozy, yeah. boozy underlying tone to it. And it, it's it, it's followed. Um, th- there's a lot of baking spices for me on this. Yeah, um, and you can um, I don't know if you can see because my room's a little bit dark here, but it's a very dark whiskey. I mean, it's it, not- it is. Yeah, mine's probably not the. I probably don't have the greatest of angles either, but it is. It's a really nice, a nice dark whiskey. Yeah, I, I had I had a very technical term in in my kind of notes that I took very well, I had grapey aspect. So <laughs> there, it was, uh, if you guys are wondering, that is uh, that's a technical term, grapey aspect. So it was, it was just, you could tell. And, and for me, like I, I said to a couple other people, I think even maybe Brent and, and Jason who were in here, I said to them, uh, cause I knew they had gotten some samples and I said, do yourself a favor, open the bottle, let the thing sit out, pour it in a glass, let it sit out, get some air and, and you'll be, you'll be rewarded. I, I just knew because I, I wanted to see what it did. When I first got it, I took a quick little sip just to kind of see what we were at. I'm like, yeah, you could tell this was one of those, those whiskeys that was going to really do well as it kind of like opened up and, and it, and it did. So. I think that the more you open it up and you know, my bottle, I, mine's one of the sample bottles that we were pouring samples out of. Uh, it's been open for a good week or so. Um, it uh, the more I get the uh, the kind of rum notes to it, I get a lot of kind of a, a molasses and maple syrup and and a really kind of a sticky sweet just hint of it on on the back of the the back of the nose, I guess you would say. Yeah, I think I must have sent you my uh, tasting notes because you're kind of hitting a few of them. <laughs> I don't want to give it. I don't want to give it away. No one's going to watch my review at all. So that did not happen, people. We we have not shared any notes on this. I promise. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully it will. So no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's a lot of those things. And like you said before, with, with the finishing aspect, if you don't, if you don't start with a quality like bourbon, you're going to still be able to get the underlying, not so good bourbon notes, you know, in that finished yeah. whiskey. So, I mean, you can tell you guys aren't, you know, cutting corners and trying to like, you know, stuff a young, you know, not so good whiskey into all these barrels to try to cover it up. You're already starting out with with quality and then finishing it in, in quality barrels. So we just, yeah, we just look out for stuff that's, that, that kind of piques our interest really. Does, um, does, um, is, is Kelvin Cooperage, are they kind of partially responsible for at times saying to you, Hey, we've got something, maybe, maybe you'll be interested in this. Come on down and, you know, check it out and see what it does. Yeah. I mean, the, the entire first and second batch was, was their suggestion. It was very, very clearly them. Like I said, with batch two, with that, uh, Curacao gin, uh, finish. We had a blend, but after they, they, uh, showed us those barrels, we changed the blend, uh, because we wanted to do something off the wall and kind of out of left field and challenge some palates with it. So yeah, Kelvin, Kelvin's very involved and they also taste it as we're finishing it and we get their input. Clayton in particular, Clayton and, and William down there have, have tasted uh, most of our batches and they give us lots of very honest feedback. They'll tell us at times what they don't like. It's a couple of times when it's early on, they've just said, I don't like this. I hope it gets better. Yeah. And, uh, wait a little bit longer and they say, yeah, this has gotten better. We, you know, we keep a little bit of each sample that we pull so that we can taste side by side of here's where it started. Here's where it was last time. Here's where it is today. Well, it's nice to be able to fall back on, on those guys as well. And, you know, get their, their thoughts on, on that stuff as well. You know, it's kind of important for you guys, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Just a, it's just a fantastic nose. It's, it's just, there's a lot of depth and a lot of just constant changes. I think as you go back for me, it seemed like as it, 
I don't want to say like warmed up, but I think as I got my my hands on the the glass a little bit and maybe started to slowly, you know, warm that 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 cognac, that that white grape, that grapiness started to kind of come out a little bit, you know, more for me. I think maybe that's just as it began to open up on the nose. So really, yeah, really I, I think uh, the more the more you let it open up, the more some flavors come out. Now, this is this 126.4 proof. Um, so don't don't put a coin on top of this. Um, don't don't yeah. cover the Glen Cairn when you pour it. Let it let some of that ethanol come out and you start getting more of those underlying flavors the, the longer you let it interact. Yep. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And sometimes I see I see people do that, especially with high proof whiskeys or whatever. They want to put these like little the little whiskey coins on top of things. And I think to myself, sometimes you're you're not doing, I think, necessarily what's maybe best for that particular whiskey at times to kind of just let it breathe and open up a little bit, and not not kind of trap all that like ethanol or vapors or whatever it is. Let it yeah. let it do what it needs to do. So and, and that's the reason we often splash really high proof stuff with water is to kind of dissipate that ethanol a little bit. And, and yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this one, this one comes in 126.4. It's, it's not a, it's not a weak bourbon to me. Um, this reminds me of some of the, the barrel proof stuff that, that, uh, you can get from a couple other producers, the way it kind of enters the palate. It enters in, you, you definitely know the proof on this one when it comes in. I don't, I don't think it drinks necessarily to 126, but it's certainly yeah. not like our split stave that came in at 115 and drank like it was a hundred. Yeah. And that was, I was just going to say that like in comparison to a lot of these for me now, again, I think by letting it open up, it probably helped a little bit, but when I first started nosing it and then kind of started tasting it, my first thought was to go back and look at what the proof was just because I was kind of like taken back. And, you know, when you see the thing, you know, and it says 126.4 proof, I'm like, whoa, you just, you, you never got that really on the nose and it never really translated that, that hot on the palate. You know, your first sip, of course, may, if it's your first, you know, taste, but once you get into that second or third, that 126, I mean, it starts, you know, for me, it kind of seemed like it was right down in that 110 ish range. Very, yeah. very, very approachable. Yeah. I, I really, I really like this. I, I call this one, um, Batch one and this one both. One was 123.4 and this is 126.4. They're kind of sneaky bourbons to me because I'll sit down and, you know, in the evenings and during quarantine and yeah, have a pour of it and it goes down very easily. And then uh next thing I know, I've I've had two or three pours and I think, oh, <laughs> I gotta go to bed. Yeah, those will catch those will catch up to you. Yeah. So that's kind of the the idea for me, like with with the review. I, I think with both of them being the the Kelvin collaboration, I know they're different finishes and everything, but I'll do like a small little comparison between the one and the six, just to, just to kind of see, I mean, I think we're using roughly the same, the same stock in terms of the bourbon, mm -hmm. different finish, but I'll, I'll be interested just to see the, the, com the comparison between the two. So, yep. all right, I'm going to give this one a, uh, give this one a taste and see what we get here. Yeah. So for me, like right away, the, the, the drying aspect was like, almost for me was like immediately you get that kind of like that little, that not necessarily tannic, but just that the drying from the Oak or whatever that's there. And I can see why you probably decide to, to pull this so that's not over oaked and it's super dry and, and all of that. So that was my first thought, but again, that was, that was the first sip and, you know, I think most people won't won't really judge much off of a, a first sip anyway. So it's uh for me on this one on the palate, um, I, I think it it drinks a lot just like a bourbon, uh, as opposed to a finished bourbon. I get a lot of the the spiciness of of that underlying bourbon blend. Um on the periphery, I get a lot of the rum. Um, and then as it starts to hit the rear palate, um, it and it gets into the finish, I think that, that cognac comes out a little bit. Oh, no. But by and large, I think palate and finish, the rum is a little stronger than the cognac on this one. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I think it's a uh, it's a very full bodied whiskey, though, for me. Um, does coat the palate very well for me. And I, I, I think that's probably 75 percent uh, finished barrels on that one because this was not a particularly long uh, viscous whiskey uh, at the start. Yeah, it's just it really it's it's one of like a. Oh man, how do I, how do I like say this? It's one of those whiskeys that for me, that 
it's fun to sit down with, or just a whiskey like this in general is fun to sit down with because I think the more you sip on it and, and let it coat your palate, it starts to just do a lot of different things. You pull out a lot of different, you know, flavor profiles. And for me, what, what it started to kind of do was where I thought if I had something like more on the, the front to the mid palate that later on, after a couple more sips, the wave started to kind of continue. It just started to fall back a little bit more. So for me, it actually made this finish, I thought, fairly long. It really just kind of developed into a lot of, you know, different waves of of flavors for the most part. I, I think this is one that um, you don't want to take a single tiny sip and judge it by that. This is one that if, if you follow up that first one with the second one, the finish gets even longer on the second sip and they kind of build on each other really well. I, I don't want you to, you know, down six ounces of this, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And gulp. But uh, you know, take a little sip. You know, move it around the, the the palate a little bit and swallow, and then and don't wait for a long time before you before you dive back into it. You know, before yeah. that finish is wholly dissipated, have another small sip of it and do the same thing. And what you'll notice is that by the second or third, very small, very tiny sip, this becomes a really long finish and really kind of pleasing. Yeah, I I would agree, and and it does. I mean, I think as for me, a lot of the upfront, you get like kind of hit with that, that dryness up front, a little bit of the, the baking spice. And then it starts to quickly like kind of get into, you know, some of that like maple syrup and then translates into, you know, some of the, the, the white grape, that grapiness, cognac. And, and that, that rum for me was sneaky. It was kind of like, I tried to search for it to see like where some of that stuff was. And I think it was always there it was just, it was the, the underlying sweetness that was there. You know, you always think, you always think of like the vanillas and the caramels and that stuff is there. But I think that that dark rum is there more than people necessarily think it's there. I I think a lot of people are going to mistake the, um, the rum for the bourbon, uh, because this isn't, this isn't a super sweet bourbon. It's a spicy bourbon going in. It's a high rye. It's not. It's not like a Heaven Hill corn forward type of thing. So, um, a lot of people are going to get a lot of sweetness in this, and and you're you're either getting that really from the mostly from the cognac and the rum. It's not from the underlying whiskey. I mean, it's there because every bourbon has a at least fifty percent corn. This would be in seventy four. Uh, but you know, I, I think most of the the sweetness that you're getting on this, especially on the outer palate, the kind of the periphery, that's all dark rum. Yeah, you do. I mean, for me, that sweetness it really hits like mid and back of the palate, like right on the side of the tongue. Like I get all that sweetness that's there. And it's just a really, really nice, just like warming finish that it has on it. That, that baking spice and that dark rum. Um, I, I had it like, I, I had in like my notes, which is a little bit like strange. I just had something that it reminded me of like maple syrup and waffles. I don't know. I don't know what it was. There was just that moment when I was tasting it that it was just like very maple syrup. Like, I don't know what it was with the, with the waffles or whatever, but it just, I don't know, something triggered that in, in me, but it was. I'm, I'm very glad to hear you say that because that was one of the things that I said, I, I got the most on our first batch. And mm-hmm. since this one is kind of supposed to be a follow-up to that, yeah. I'm very glad that there's some common that people are finding some of the same some of the same elements that, that I found in the first batch. It's just like, you know, it's just an overall like, like wave of flavors, which I think is what a lot of people, especially most of the people in the chat and everything right now, you know, appreciate with a, with a good whiskey period, you know, those just, it changes it evolves and and all that. Yeah. Like Wes said, he says molasses. It's, it is, it's a lot of that. There's just that, that underlying, thick molasses maple syrupy sweetness that's there combined with you know that dark rum and all the other good underlying um you know bourbon notes that are there so really nice bourbon all right so well we're almost we're getting close to uh close to an hour so um anything else you uh you kind of want to share uh with everybody in terms of uh, anything else that's kind of going on? Uh, no, I, I know uh, Bobby, my partner, is out there watching right now. And just Bobby, we're, we're thinking about you. Hang in there. And um, um, thoughts and prayers to you and your family tonight. Yeah, definitely uh, condolences to to you and your family. So 
Um, yeah, so that was one thing. So uh, I'm glad Jason mentioned it right here. So um, if you guys haven't, so Fred Minnick is doing a little bit of a head-to-head -head batch six. And what's the other one? Is he doing like the Blood Oath, like pack six or something? Is he doing that as a comparable? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 Blood Oath um, six. So that'll be a really interesting one. So um, I, I think he's going to be starting here in a, a couple minutes. So that'll be a really interesting kind of uh, transition. I'm sure everybody will be uh, excited to see what what Fred has to say about both of these. So, um, so I want to say thanks, Bill, for uh, for coming on tonight. I think this gave a, everybody a pretty good perspective of like really what you should like expect from from Forgate is always something different, quality. Um, you know, the uniqueness factor. And that's, that's for me, you know, one of my, you know, my favorite things uh, about what you guys do. So, um, you know, I think that again, a lot of people in the chat, you know, hopefully, um, you know, understand that, uh, understand that as well. So um, everybody uh, in the chat right now, thanks so much for, for joining tonight. Um, you know, hopefully you learned a little bit more about, uh, you know, the four gate brand and, and especially some of batch six. And if you haven't done it, let me throw in uh, before we leave, just so you guys get it. And anybody else who uh, hasn't seen it yet, you can go over to the, the seal box.com. Last time I checked, there was batches two, four, five, and six still available. So if uh, any of those are, are ones you want six being the, uh, the newest batch. And then the rye you said is coming out like in summer. Yeah, probably June somewhere in there. And will that, will that be something that will hit seal box as well? Or sure. Hope so. Okay. <laughs> that's up to, that's up to Blake. If, okay. he wants to, if he wants to keep doing it, then we we're more than happy. We, we, we really like that relationship. Chris says, send it to Canada. LOL. We'll need a, I think we need an exporter license or something for that, or need an yeah. importer to come buy it. I don't know. I don't know yeah. how that works. Yeah. Let's get it. Let's get it in state number three before we, <laughs> yeah. Number yeah two. That's what I said to Chris before I was chatting with him. And, uh, that's what I told him. I said, we're probably going to need to get into a few more of the, uh, the states within the United States that, uh, uh, before it gets to Canada, unfortunately. So, but all right. So again, Bill, thanks for coming on tonight. I appreciate it. Everybody in the chat. Thanks for joining tonight again. Hopefully you got a little bit of, uh, something out of this and, uh, and then this, uh, you know, kind of helped you understand a little bit more about, uh, four gate and what they've got going on. So with that being said, everybody cheers. Thanks again for joining, uh, tonight and uh we'll see you uh next tuesday cheers Thanks. cheers